Okay, so I am carving some uh, poppy flowers and vines, well, stems, onto uh, a book cover that I'm working on. I figured I'd do a little quick video on how to do this. I haven't done any carving recently, so I'm a little bit out of practice. Um, I even like to point out a couple places I've made mistakes. Some of them are pretty minor. Like there's places I've cut past a line and made a little mark. There's places where I'm not entirely sure I must have angled the swivel knife. Made little flaps. You know, things that somebody of my experience level shouldn't do. But, like I said, out of practice. But anyway, I've got it all cut and I've wet it down and let it sit for a few minutes and it is starting to uh, dry back out. It actually looks a little drier on camera, I think, than it is in person, but this is basically where you want to start carving. You don't want it to be just wet down and sopping wet. You want that water to soak in, and you'll get better details that way. Uh, some lines that I did not cut are around these flower centers. I didn't cut those lines. And I'm going to use a camouflage tool around those. You can also use, for Sheridan carving, they have... Um, there's the flower center and then there's a tool that goes out from it. Um, I don't remember if it's a leaf liner or they have names for them and I don't remember what those are. Off the top of my head. But in this case, I'm just going to use a camouflager that I've got laying around. That looks about right. And I'm tilting the camouflager side to side um, to do some partial impressions and work my way around sometimes to get it to fit in. And part of why I'm doing this is poppies have a sort of wrinkled looking texture to them. We'll extend that out later. And I'm going to use lined pear shaders as well for the same reason. Um, if I can get the camera to quite focus on that. But yeah, there's going to be lines running um, long ways down these pear shaders. You can also get them where they run across. Um, and I've got two different size ones that I'm using for this. I'm not sure if these are still available or not. 215 and a 20, what is that? 209? 203? The stamp is very small. I thought 203 was a beveler. But anyway. And I'm going to kind of do a Sheridan style of... Thumbprint is what they refer to pear shaders as. And all these little, out near the end of the flower petals, I'm going to hit with the Pear shader real quick. I'm going to use a larger pear shader to work some of those in. Basically do the same thing on all these flowers. Of course we're going to go back and bevel those to make them really stand up too. But you want to do your pear shading before you're beveling. 
At least that's the way I learned it. Uh, in case your parachuting gets too close to the line, your bevler can kind of push it back up. And as always when carving flowers, remember your focal point is usually right down here where the bottom of those seeds are. Uh, and most of your stuff needs to kind of work its way towards that. Very important when you got something lined like this because you can't really fudge that like you can with a smooth one by just curving it at the end. You got to kind of point stuff the way you want it to be. This is also kind of my reasoning for doing that uh, camouflaging first. Or the flower center in the center of it first. Is that I can kind of blend in better with the uh, pear shader. After I've done that. Whereas if I did those later... I just have those marks, which are a little off sometimes, on top of the pear shading. Okay, most of the rest of this is just going to be a lot of beveling. Uh, all these little stems around the flowers. I do have a little bit to do on these fellows, which I don't remember if those are seed pods or if those are actually buds for new ones. Whatever. Um, and then I've got these turn backs I have to probably use a modeling tool to smooth out. But we'll get to that. Now, I like using textured bevelers. And I don't even know if the numbers on all of these are accurate. Uh, because some of them I've added texture to smooth ones. So... We'll have to see where we get with that. Like this one, this is a 203, so yeah, I was right, 203 is a beveler. Um, that pear shader was either a 208 or a 209, I couldn't tell what the stamp said on it. I'm pretty sure a 203 is supposed to be a smooth beveler. Like I said, I've added, uh, with checkering files, I've added uh, texture to some of these to make a more aggressive texture in some cases. have these figure carving tools that are uh, I call them figure carving bevelers they're a pointed beveler for getting into these corners I think that's very important for the depth of your carving to get up in those corners real good with your beveling that's the type of thing that catches your eye even though you don't realize that your brain sees that and says oh those are actually the same layer and you want to do these flowers first because they're in front of everything they're in front of all these stems and so on and you always want to do foremost first on any of your tooling, beveling, whatever. You want to work from the foreground to the background. Otherwise, you're just pressing it all into the same layer. Um, you're not making multiple layers in your carpet.
I know it's very tempting to start one place and then just work work all these vines until you get to another flower and then work that flower. But that's not the way to do it. You want to do all the flowers first in this pattern and then you want to go to the background elements. Or to the mid-ground elements and then background between them. Mat it down, whatever you're going to do for your backgrounding. And you can bevel to different depths too. You don't have to, on these flowers, bevel it down as hard as you do around the outside edge. Um, you can be a little lighter with your mallet, learn some mallet control, and you can actually come up with some interesting uh, depth to your carving just from that. But anyway, there's just going to be a whole lot more of that on these flowers. And then we're going to do the vines the same way. The part you'll see on these, um, a lot of on floral carving. And it's a way to get a pattern piece to fit someplace where it didn't really fit, is to do a turn back on a, a leaf or a petal. And that's what's on this right here, to make it look like that comes out and then rolls back. Um, so you basically, on these, usually you're going to bevel around the outside of it, and then you're going to bevel real lightly around this area that's turned down. So just barely tapping away at it. And then make this part look like it's coming out and rolling up we're going to go along like this with a modeling spoon basically kind of double bevel this line we're just doing the second side with the modeling spoon and then we're going to double bevel this line Make it look like that rolls out. Make sure we don't lose our depth on this side because that pedal does stick out quite far. And a lot of these flowers along the top here, and then this one down here on the bottom, there's a lot of turn backs in this particular pattern. So, got to watch out for those. Okay, now that leather's getting pretty dry, but I'm working on smaller areas, so it should work just fine still. Um, this is all still the first time I've wet it down. So I haven't gone and re-wet it again yet. But anyway, let's work on some of these vines. And again, just trying to try to get all these places where you get overlaps and corners even down. I'm mostly going around the outside edges of everything. And any place I've got big areas. But I'm going to count on... Um, really finishing this up with my backgrounding tool when I go around and do that. You can see what I did over here. Um, because some of this is really tight areas. And I do have a smaller beveler. get into some of these tight spots uh, 
but you gotta be still very careful not to squish stuff you don't want to squish even with those so for the most part like I said I'm just kind of getting the majority of it with these but these are really narrow vines and I don't want to smash them down so I'm probably going to just do most of it with a modeling spoon and like I said rely on my backgrounder after I get these large areas and don't forget when you get into some of these areas that are tighter like this here you can tilt your beveler to get more of an angle on it so you don't smash down your flower petals or something like that while you're going along in between these vines it doesn't work nearly as well because it just kind of pushes the leather out into the other vines but anyway let's go ahead and switch over to some backgrounders i've got a 104 and a 104-2 here um basically small and smaller backgrounders and we're going to use those to press this area down in between the vines and backgrounders tend to work best when the leather is like this when it's almost completely dry again but it's still got enough moisture into it to really take an impression Some of these areas are pretty small, that's why I've got the half-sized one, which is the dash two. I've even seen it referred to as a 104 half. And these areas that open to the outside, I'm just going to go ahead and background up those away. And then just sort of taper it out. Because I'll come back with a matting tool and blend that a little bit. But for now, that should cover it. Do the same thing on this one. Okay, now all these places I got vines crossing over vines, I need to go back and kind of taper them into each other to make one vine stand out above the others. But that's easy to do with the modeling tool. At least on these small of areas. If they were larger, of course, you could just do this with the beveler. You just have to be very careful about your order that you bevel everything in. And then we can go back and we can use the edge of the modeling spoon, kind of like a pencil. We can draw in some texture on these vines if we want. They should already be sort of rounded out, but you can round them out too with the edge with the flat of the modeling spoon. Like I said, I like to put just a little bit of wild looking lines on it to kind of sketch them on. just to add some interest to the whole thing. Now, I gotta do the same thing down here. 
and I got to do around these little pods. And then we'll go on to matting the outside. All right, now then, these little, I don't know if they're buds or seed pods or what. I saw something similar on some pictures of some poppies. Decided to include it in to fill in some dead spaces that I had. Um, they're real easy to bevel around. But they're supposed to be round, and they're supposed to be kind of separated from their stem a little bit, so I'm going to sort of just take a modeling tool, round them out, just like I would an acorn or something, and sort of add a little boop right in there. And my plan on these is to then take a decorative cut on them with the swivel knife. And basically just kind of start at the tip and sort of squiggle my way down to the stem and just add that little detail in there kind of like a, a flower bud I don't know if that's what they are or not but that's the way I'm carving them and from there it's just going to be a little bit more backgrounding matting and then I need to do the cedars and the decorative cuts inside the flowers. Alright, matting tools I'm using are textured matters. Uh, they're figure carving tools officially F900 and 899. I'm going to do most of it with the 900, the bigger one. And matting just spreads out that beveling further really makes stuff stand out a little bit more and I'm gonna do it in the center too This is one of the spots the 899 is a little nice to have is getting these little tighter spots. Okay, last couple things to do on this. I have, I did one flower already. Uh, I have a cedar here and it is a long thin, um, I don't remember what these are specifically called. It's got a point on each side instead of just being round. Um, this is the S628. It's a very tiny one. Um, not sure I can even get the camera to decide to focus on it. But, I'm going to use it kind of angled to the side. And it should make sharp, sort of looking seeds. Really tilting it a lot to push up the center of the flower and give it a sharp seeded texture. Give it that kind of cone of seeds that's in the center of a poppy. Rather than mash everything down. And on these sideways ones, we're going to kind of do the same thing. We're going to push in from the outside. Get 
keep it angled in like that. And in this case, the decorative cuts are really going to look like the stamens in the flowers. So I just want to do some little short and like curl in to the center. And when I go and antique this, those will be nice dark lines that'll show up. Basically, I'm starting with the blade kind of sideways and letting it and curving it in real quick to angle in towards where I want to go to. You can do it slower, um, but I get the best results when I do a nice quick little flip with it. Um, I think that's all my carving on this. So next it'll be going on to coloring these. Okay, now for a little bit of coloring on this. Um, I'm going to do, of course, red for the poppies, green for all the leaves and such. Uh, these little portion cups are great for when you're working with a small amount of dye and you don't want to risk spilling the whole bottle. And I'm just going to paint these in with a fairly cheap paintbrush. Now you got to be careful whenever you're using dye instead of paint like this because as you can see it spreads quite a bit away from where the brush touches so you want to start in the middle and work your way out to the sides as the brush gets drier so that you don't spread outside the area that you want to cover um, another thing that I've noticed quite often uh, that I like to do is when I'm getting near an edge, I like to have uh, the brush over top of the piece that's the color I'm uh, working with. So like this, I'll work on it like that way. So that if I push down too hard, I don't wind up squishing off here. When I start working out like this, it's actually a lot better to turn your piece So you don't risk making a mistake. And I'll probably go over a couple coats like this. Just sort of painting away. So it's going to be a while on that. But I'll get back to you whenever I've got more of it done. Alright, between colors, I take some denatured alcohol and rinse out the brush rinse out the little cup because I'm cheap enough that I reuse these as well. Um, now the flower centers here, the seeded part, um, I'm going to use not a black dye on those. I don't think they really need to be entirely black though they look kind of black in real life. I'm going to use a of and die. Um, and basically, since it's so much darker than the red, I did not bother trying to go around it with the red. Because we'll just let this sort of fill in. And we'll let some uh, antique stain really do our shadows later. The quarter is such a dark brownish red color that it looks black unless you put it right next to something that actually is black. So it should work really well for these centers and look more natural than just a black dye would. Now on these vines and flower buds I'm gonna have to just be very careful because these are very thin and I may even take um, whenever I load the brush, instead of going right to the leather, I may take a paper towel and daub some of the, the dye off so that I can then go along those without getting dye everywhere. Now, I'll still probably get some in the background, but I'm planning on uh, resist finishing this and then going over with an antique stain. So a lot of that is background flubs are going to be covered up or at least 
well hidden in the um, antique stain. But it's always still best to avoid them to start with. And again, gonna be a while, but we'll come back to this. Now, my plan is to um, use some antique stain to add some shadows and to color the rest of the leather. So I'm just gonna go over everything with a clear finish. I'm using uh, a Super Sheen acrylic to resist the antique stain and keep it from just making these flowers brown. And I'll go over a couple coats of that as well, just to make sure I hit everything on these flowers. And I'll use a smaller brush to go over the vines. Doesn't look like much. Just cover it all up and then let it dry entirely and cure entirely, which doesn't mean dry to the touch. It means let it sit overnight or at least eight or 10 hours during the day before you come back and do your antique stain. So I'm going to work on this and let it sit. And because of the power of video editing, you guys are going to get to see the antiquing right away. Okay, it is the next day for me. Uh, this is dry entirely, and I can't stress that enough because if you don't let it dry overnight, basically give that uh, acrylic a chance to really cure, your antique stain is going to stick in weird ways to the uh, acrylic. Just little patches, will, some of it will stay, and other places it won't. And it really makes a mess of your project, so... I know the patience for that is tricky sometimes, but it's very important to let it dry all the way. So I'm going to be using a black antique stain on this because black was the color requested. And as always with antique stain, it's going to look like I'm making an absolute mess out of this project. But we've got that resist on there, so let's see what it does. And we're going to go over several times. Basically, putting the antique on, removing any excess, especially from the flowers. But you don't get much of a black out of this in just one coat. You need more of this dark brown. If you want a really solid black, sometimes you have to actually dye most of it and then just antique around your carving. Keeping a damp paper towel around, or actually, in this case, it's probably going to be a bunch of them. Uh, you can clean off a lot of the antique on the resisted surfaces. I just kind of buff everything with a dry paper towel. Now, for a finish over top of this, I don't like running the risk of um, making smeared lines from the antiquing over my carving, so I like to use a spray finish. Particularly, I use this leather sheen spray. Um, it's quick and easy. And you don't have to worry about, like I said, picking up any of your antique stain and spreading it about over your carving. This will lock it all in. And it'll dry in about 20 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, somewhere in there, you know. Give it a while. It'll be fine. 